one of the charity groups down in Brighton come up this morning. Early start. <laughs> um, and they're going to talk to us through um, end of life care in gypsy and travelling communities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, I am Sarah Sweeney. Um, I'm the Communications and Health Policy Coordinator at Friends, Families and Travellers. I'm Avril Fuller. I'm a youth coordinator. Uh, though I've been with FFT for 17 years, so I've worked in engaged gypsies and travellers into most services, whether that be housing, social services, hospitals, GPs, you name it, I think we've engaged them. And I've worked across the board with all different types of health needs. Um, so FFT, it's our short term of our name, just to make it easier. Um, then we've been going for, next year's the 25th birthday, so you're all invited of course to the party. Um, <laughs> We do kind of a wide range of things, as Apple says. We do some um, policy work as well, some parliamentary work and things. Um, there are lots of areas across like accommodation, education, um, health, where gypsies um, and travellers have our outcome from services. We kind of work across it. We're um, jack of all trades, kind of master of none. <laughs> so, in a sense, we're not an expert. We're not experts at all at end of life care. But certainly, Apple here has done a lot of case work supporting um, clients um, through that whole process and things. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some insights about culture and those other things as well. Um, but hopefully we can give you any information you want. Um, we've divided the presentation into kind of three sections. So the first section is like a background to gypsy and travellers generally. Some people are like what uh, there's uh, to kind of define things and that sort of stuff. And then we'll do a section um, about end of life care and preferences around that. Um, and then the last section will be about bereavement and situations and customs around um, death and dying. Um, and in between each of those sections, we will have a big opportunity for questions, so please do think of them <laughs> as much as possible. Um, most of the time when we go for do presentations, I'm not sure whether you just don't cover all the off topics as well, as well as you should, but there's always lots of questions. And um, certainly that's probably how you get a lot of the information out of Avril, um, who's got a lot of the insights from the ground as well. Um, we're going to have about a five minute comfort break about halfway through. Hopefully I've got a waiver at that time, so I know uh, to stop talking for a bit. <laughs> um, so just to give you a bit of background to begin with, um, so there's about 300,000 uh, roughly gypsies and travellers in the UK. Um, so there's lots of different communities. So you've got Romani gypsy communities, Irish traveller communities, you've got boaters, you've got um, Welsh gypsies and travellers, you've got new travellers. So I'm going to go through some of those different communities and try to pick that apart for you. Um, I imagine that unless you are a traveller or gypsy yourself in the room or you've got close friends to you, then a lot of your insights into gypsy and traveller communities will either be from TV or from the press. Um, and I think the first thing I would say was really don't listen to anything <laughs> that you see on the TV and the press about gypsies and travellers. If you're starting with those assumptions, um, they're probably going to lead you down some very weird paths I and mean, it's not, just not quite true. Um, I don't know if anyone here has seen the show My Big Fat Gypsy Wedding. Um, I think that's a kind of, it's kind of the equivalent of watching Towie and thinking that that's how everyone in Essex is. So I think yeah. to take that with a pinch of salt. There'll be some things there that will have some level of trueness in them, um, but certainly a lot of the things are, are reality TV and made for entertainment and things. Um, and the same with newspapers and things. I think um, a lot of the time you see quite flashy headlines of things, but actually a lot of those don't really reflect um, how people are on the ground. So I hope that if you've come into contact with Gypsies and Trials before, um, then you'll, you'll be aware that actually it doesn't quite match up. Um, I think that'll come through through this presentation. Um, so you've got, first of all, kind of the first group we'll talk about is Romani Gypsies. You yourself are Romani Gypsies, yes. so you can definitely talk a lot about this. Um, so Romani Gypsies arrived in the UK around the 16th century. Um, they originated from India, they kind of migrated across. I'm not going to go into too much into history, um, but it's kind of a distinct and separate group from Irish travellers, who, as you can imagine, came from Ireland, <laughs> hence the thick Irish accents. <laughs> um, and both groups were traditionally nomadic. Um, there's different nomadic groups in Scotland, in Wales, um, and um, Irish travellers will often, um, <coughs> and many families will speak Cant, um, and then Romani and Gammon, yeah. Um, and Romani Gypsies and Romanes is quite a big language, so a lot of people don't realise the kind of really rich culture and heritage in gypsy and traveller communities. Um, I think it's something that's kind of overlooked, and sometimes um, because a lot of gypsies and travellers don't travel so much anymore, then I think people cease to realise if someone's not travelling anymore, they assume, oh, they're settled people like us maybe. Um, but actually, that, that rich culture passes over whether or not you're travelling or whether you're not travelling. You don't suddenly, I mean, I'm, I'm from Northern Ireland, I didn't suddenly forget that moment I stepped foot step in England sort of thing. Um, so that goes a long way. Um, you've got um, boaters, notice on the, on the trains on the way up, um, there's a lot of canals and things on the way here. Um, and uh, there's kind of two different, so 
most voters, I'd say maybe it's not such a, a historical culture that some families maybe would be um, voters for generations and things, but it wouldn't be the same like maybe length of history as gypsies and travellers. Um, you also have um, new travellers um, who will maybe hit the road at a different time. So for example, if I, if I was today, and I'm, I'm not from a gypsy travel community traditionally, was to hit the road um, and travel around that way, then probably I would be put in that bracket new travellers. Um, there's lots of different reasons people might do that. It could be because there's enough festivals, it could be because um, with Fairground and show people maybe that they're, they're doing that. Um, but there's lots of different reasons and therefore it's quite hard to make big generalisations. But people might experience some of the same difficulties with access and services. People might experience the hostility um, when they go to new areas. Um, and people um, are, are all different at the end of the day, so there's not huge generalisations. Um, there's two <coughs> groups currently underneath English um, law that are defined as ethnic groups, and that's Romani Gypsies and Irish Travellers. Uh, but certainly some of the other groups like Welsh Gypsies and Travellers and Scottish Gypsies and Travellers, it's only a matter of time. We need a piece of case law to establish it, but that hasn't happened just yet. Um, so yeah, that gives a bit of a background. So um, the, in the 2011 census, then, um, they asked people about the accommodation type they lived in. So you can see that it's roughly just under a quarter of Gypsies and Travellers who responded to the census, which was a, a small portion, perhaps, of Gypsies and Travellers in the UK who said that they were still living on like a mobile home and were kind of temporary structures, like a car and other things, and moving around. Um, so the, the vast majority are living in, in houses um, and other places like that. Um, and of that amount, then, I think most of the time when you see Gypsies and Travellers in the press, um, certainly in newspapers and big like tabloids and things, will be if there's been like an unauthorised encampment in a local park and things. So that, that really represents a very slim proportion of that population. So of the 25% who are mobile, only 16% have no access to um, authorised land. Um, so we'll be forced to put, pull up in like parks and things. Historically, I mean particularly with Romney Gypsy communities, then uh, people would travel around often for agriculture and things, which often I think <coughs> is maybe why there tends to be a higher concentration in the southeast of England of gypsies and travellers, but certainly they're they're all over the UK. Um, then there was like stocking places and things where informal agreements were made with like farmers or local landowners. And people would stop there for a certain amount of time, say for a month or two months and things, and they'd agree with the landowner, we'll stay for this amount of time and then we'll move on. And as just um, there's been more pressures on land and things, then people are more likely to either accidentally or on purpose kind of block off land, so gypsies and travellers can't do that, which is why you get whenever plan information is quite hard to get for gypsy and travellers thanks, people put in an application. And um, I think most people will be aware there's a level of hostility against um, many gypsies and travellers in the UK that can be quite hard to get that. So there's actually not that, there's often not a, a place to go, which is why you get people in public places, but that is just a small portion. I think people who are living um, on unauthorised sites then may be subject to quite um, regular evictions. So from just a health care point of view, and from that continuity of care point of view, that might just require some extra thinking about how you can support people um, in that situation. Um, there's just a kind of structural difference there, I guess, with if you have no letter, you can't post a letter to someone and that sort of thing, you might just have to think through how you communicate with um, with service users. Um, so yeah, there's also some issues there around access and like water and sanitation, um, access and electricity and things, people might use generators and stuff, so just if there's if there's things around people's care that they need access to the things, you might just have to think more than perhaps you would if someone was in kind of bricks and mortar accommodation. Um, yeah. In terms of um, social exclusion, this is a piece of research done in 2017 um, by another charity that um, we work with quite a lot called Traveller Movement, um, and they did it with YouGov. So they found that it was um, only 41% of British parents would be happy for their child um, to play at the home of a gypsy or traveller child. Um, it said that only um, over 1 in 10 uh, British adults thought that it was okay for um, pubs and restaurants in the UK to refuse summer service just because they're gypsy and traveller. Um, and then also then 42% of British adults said they'd be unhappy if a close relative um, uh, had a long-term relationship and marriage with a member of the gypsy and traveller community. So I think that paints a picture um, of, of real discrimination in society and, and quite, um, quite deep-rooted um, and quite, quite acceptable, um, as in it's an accepted maybe form of racism in a way that some other forms of racism would be uh, condemned by perhaps more people. So it was in uh, this year then the Equality and Human Rights Commission they did this like social barometer test um, across British um, communities and they asked people um, about the different protected characteristic groups so like gender, um, age, um, LGBT groups, uh, around like race and things as well. They asked people um, what, what their feelings were towards different groups of people and the, on the only group um, to which um, most people felt a negative feeling um, was gypsies and travellers. So there's that real um, discrimination of things that 
um, that we all might need to challenge in ourselves and that we might need to challenge in colleagues and things. That people might come with a, a preconception, a negative preconception. Um, so yeah, and that kind of is a little bit um, fueled then by the press. So I'm just showing you the slides. These aren't real headlines. They're where we've replaced the word traveller with another protected characteristic for another, another group. So I think it'd be quite unlikely um, that you warning um, or Asians, Asians leave even more mess and these sort of things. But these are all real headlines that have been written about travellers um, in the press. So that kind of just demonstrates what, what's okay to say and what's not okay to say. Um, I know certainly we were talking as a chain on the way here. And I think sometimes um, because of that accepted level of racism, then even more nervous, we're going to ask questions that maybe I don't think would ever be asked about like me and my family and things. Um, I think it can be quite dehumanising and stuff. So I think it's about asking the right questions in the right times and to the right people and things and just being kind and considerate. It always kind of comes back to that most things in life. <laughs> so in terms of um, overall gypsy and traveller health, I think perhaps um, similar to like a lot of the groups that have been covered in this um, vulnerable populations, a lecture series, then um, gypsies and travellers do experience quite poor health compared to the general population. Um, so uh, in the 2011 census they found that whereas 81% of the general population said that their health was good or very good, it was only 70% of gypsies and travellers. Um, and then the, the things that kind of like come out as they reoccur in issues across gypsy and traveller communities. Um, now the NHS data addiction doesn't collect um, the gypsy and travel ethnicity, although we're campaigning for that. Um, so hopefully soon we'll have more evidence on this, as in like national evidence that we can use to inform uh, policy making how services are commissioned and things. Um, but this is one of the biggest surveys that's ever been done of gypsy and travel health by a guy called Parry in 2007. Um, so it found really high levels of long-term illness, um, health problems, disabilities, uh, which limit people's daily activities and work high levels of anxiety and depression. We do, we do quite a lot of um, outreach and support work around mental health. Um, and a lot of the time, people maybe haven't access to services for a long time or need to require some support with accessing services and things. Um, we've got high levels of chest pain, quite high levels of, of smoking as well, um, of respiratory problems, which perhaps could be linked to some of the smoking and things too. Um, and then there's also um, really high um, maternal um, morbidity rates and, um, of young children as well. Um, passing away, and um, so that's something just to be aware of the wider health picture. And um, yeah, in terms of life expectancy, I hear lots of different um, figures thrown around. They're all from different surveys. So some, I think, um, the, the understanding is that life expectancy for gypsies and travellers is somewhere between ten and twenty-five years shorter than the, popula the general population. So there was a survey in Leeds that found that gypsies and travellers in Leeds were living twenty-five years shorter than um, age, uh, than sex-matched um, population. Then the, the other places that a lot of the gypsy and traveller statistics come from are from the Republic of Ireland, from Irish travellers. There have been um, some bigger studies there, uh, gathering information. So that's where kind of some of the different figures come from. So if you hear different ones, that could be why, because it's not really an empirical, this is the answer, because all the data isn't being collected centrally. Um, does anyone have any questions, just generally about uh, gypsies and travellers, uh, the community itself? You can ask more about history, um, are those sort of things. Is there any questions that pop up so far? That's fine. Is it just the Romani <coughs> gypsies and the Irish, Irish travellers that have that protected? Yeah, so Romani gypsies and Irish travellers are both under case law, so it's, um, there's a thing called the Manly criteria, so it's if you, um, in order to be considered an ethnic group, you have to have, I think it's like a, a history, um, they, if you have a common language, that's always um, like a bonus, uh, shared culture, shared traditions and things, so they've, they've reached that through case law, but certainly Scottish gypsies and travellers and Welsh gypsies and travellers they would definitely pass that in case also they should be considered as a protected characteristic group is what we'd say. Um, and, it, and actually, because there's been so many generations of like new travellers and things, and some people have grown up through their whole lives and fair, uh, fairground people with a really sick culture and actually it's just a matter of time for the British law to catch up on that and things are like a legal process than anything else. Um, so yeah, they're the ones who are considered as protected characteristics and things. And I think a lot, uh, some gypsies come back as new travellers as well. Uh, we're at least four generations down with some of the new travellers. Uh, so they are, they are a community at the end of the day, and they are beginning to work towards becoming an ethnic group themselves. Um, has anyone ever engaged with any gypsies or supported any gypsies? No? Yes. What's well, short time, I'm working in a hospital, so it tends to be on the a short time and they, they, they tend to be a crisis. Yeah. 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 
And sorry, when they come into the hospital, how do you sort of manage? Because usually they come in with other family members. Yeah, yeah. On um, saying that though, they are not the only <coughs> group of people who do that. No. Um, so we, we are used to some patients finding that it, 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 it's, it's important for lots of people to have lots of family around. Yeah. And that tends to be then about trying to find side rooms, uh, trying to make day rooms available at certain times of day, which can cause difficulties with other patients coming in. And their families. No, that, yeah. I think that's brilliant that you're doing that because yeah. um, I've got to say that is the the sort of uh, model that we would encourage yeah. because obviously there is family members coming in and usually what we try to encourage is perhaps finding one family member that you can really mm -hmm. communicate with yeah. and that usually works, yeah? yeah. Oh, good. Not that's always. good practice. Not always. No. Um, mm. But as I said, that's not something that's unique to and I think sometimes it's, it's, it's trying to manage their expectations as, as well. Yeah. Um, you know, like you say, in the ward environment, especially if you can't have sound room, it can be difficult. And then, of course, you always worry as a health professional are we isolating them? Are we cutting them off just so that mm. we, we, we don't have to worry about this? But I have to say, the vast majority of our families, they're, they're happy to have a side room and they know that they can have that. Sounds like good practice. Mm. I've, I've noticed a couple of um, at home because I work in the community in yeah. hospital with my personal trust, it was a previous trust, and um, everything was absolutely fine in, with the kind of a small uh, caravan, um, what's it called, area where they were. Um, the problems that we encountered. So, um, but we were caring for her at her home, which happened to be in a caravan, and the practicalities of getting, well, we got the equipment in, but having to try and nurse somebody in a small mm -hmm. bedroom of a space mm -hmm. was impractical, mm -hmm. you know, because you couldn't reposition, because you only had the one side, so it's from a practical point of view, we had the problem. Mm -hmm. But that, that's good, that sounds like brilliant practice um, that you managed to do that. Yeah, yeah I think um, sometimes in the past then, um, like with adults or services and things, then um, we've had a, we've worked with families um, on caravan sites, for example, um, where I think sometimes social workers, because they don't feel, um, they're not sure quite how to adapt it, then their first, their first instance is like, let's get this person into your house and then we'll deal with these issues because everything yes. will be simpler when someone's in a house sort of thing. But actually the fact that you've made the effort then to go and reach out to people where they are, and things and support people in their own living environments. Of course, that does make a big difference. Is a big difference to people's care, and there will be um, practical considerations once there. So hopefully, we can draw on a few more of those then today. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions at all about the different groups and things? Something I just um, thought would be probably quite useful to clarify, because um, we got a lot of a um, uh, lot of confusion between this. Um, so you you may have noticed in the last um, 10, 15 years or so, then. There have been more Roma people arriving in the UK from um, from Europe, um, generally as the EU has expanded and things. Um, and a lot of people find it difficult to tell the difference between like Roma and Romani Gypsy and things. So what is the difference? Because often you find that Roma families tend to live in in houses and things. Maybe you come from the biggest the biggest population in Europe is in Romania, um, and then the, the countries around that also have quite big populations as well. Um, and there will be other. Um, uh, issues then with with uh, working with them or more challenges or barriers and things too, and um, so in, in to con contextualise it then so Romani gypsies so nomadic communities in in the UK um, actually originate from India as do Roma but basically w while they were migrating Roma communities made it to, to Europe but not quite as far um, as the UK so that's maybe the, the distinction there and of course people will have um, then grown up often in their own countries and maybe you have. Uh, children and some adults as well who lived in the UK their whole lives and things. There's some similarities between um, the cultures but also some um, some differences too and I think some of the issues with that will be around um, language as well so people often speak um, a, var a variation maybe of, of Romanes but also they speak um, say Romanian or Hungarian um, or another language too. So that's kind of the differences just in case those two have mixed into kind of one of your heads. 
that's kind of the way the press paints it, so it's very hard to know the distinctions and things. Um, so yeah, um, within uh, liveaboard voters as well, then, um, so I highlighted then that people who are living on unauthorised sites, students and travellers on unauthorised sites, then may be quite regularly evicted and things, and therefore it may present extra challenges then for uh, workers who are working with them. Um, around uh, getting in contact with them and things, where, where has the person moved to? <laughs> um, and things, and what um, health services are they entitled to in the new area as well? Um, and within liveaboard borders, then there's, um, there's people who stop in places for longer periods of time, but you've also got continuous cruisers, um, and they, uh, continuous cruisers then might have similar issues as people who are regularly evicted in terms of accessing healthcare and things, um, and just a level of that, that constant moving and things might make it um, more challenging. Um, often people know. Um, when they're going to move uh, to another area, so often they can plan that ahead and you can also plan how you can uh, create that kind of wraparound care for them in the next place they go to too, so that's I guess quite useful uh, to be aware of. It's, it's not that people are often moving like every other day or something, um, it's often longer periods of time that people will stay in places, so of course it could be that there are families out there who are moving more regularly than that, but I think the general will be, will be that, does yeah. that seem reasonable? I'm guessing you've got permanent sites in Manchester, okay. yes, and transit sites. A transit is where they stay for three months. Yeah, so a permanent site then would be kind of used as a base for a longer period and people might live on this site and then travel out to other places, <laughs> say like horse fairs or travel for work. Um, when it comes to like kids being in school and things as well, then there's like a special code for travelling children whose parents are travelling for the purposes of work and it's only for um, if they have to go for work basically. They can use like a T code and things in school and then kids can move around um, that way and then transit sites is three month periods. Often people will stay on transit sites and then they won't be able to, um, it might take longer than they might be evicted after three months until they have to leave then and then it could create some issues and things. So if, if someone is in that stage and end of life career stage, it could be quite useful to advocate for someone to be able to get onto a permanent site, although that's quite hard to get someone onto it, so it might require some um, real work with the council and things. Um, and also um, the, there's some more legal responsibility for the council when someone is in ill health and things around their access and accommodation or their right to stop somewhere and things as well. So it's, it's useful to keep in mind that if that does happen, I don't expect any of you to learn the law in that area, but what you can do is you can phone our helpline and we can send you through to um, solicitors and things or I'll give you legal advice on how you can support someone in that situation or we can support them with that aspect um, of their care and stuff because obviously it will impact upon all the other services then that you support someone with after that. Um, just pop on a little bit. Um, so just as a disclaimer before we go into the next section of our presentation, which is about preferences around um, end of life care, um, then every community is just really different. Every individual is just really different. Um, and, and nothing, it's nothing, it, most things I think that we say will hopefully give you a clue to things that you might be able to anticipate in some ways they've been overcome in the past. Um, but of course you might, you might meet someone who's a traveller who none of these things take off for basically. Um, just because the way they choose to live their life, and of course culture is an aspect of how we look at the world, but it's not the only way. Um, that governs our life decisions and things like that there. Um, so yeah, to really achieve personalised care, we have to treat a person as an individual. Um, so that kind of goes without saying, I guess. Um, I think just general principles that we've um, come up with through like quite a few years of, um, of outreach and working with gypsy and traveller communities. I think one of the key things that creates a real issue, um, if you don't get it right, um, is communication. Um, so how do you communicate to someone who isn't um, at a fixed address if you send a letter and things. There's someone I was speaking to recently um, who's receiving end of life care and is um, at home um, and, and she was saying that all of her friends who are living in houses who are kind of in similar stages with, um, with cancer that someone is particularly with, um, then they receive like regular letters like updates about their condition and that sort of stuff. She's not receiving any of that, it's just not coming through to her because the person who's responsible for communicating with her is communicating in a way that she can't engage with basically. Um, so something that we would do um, often um, with clients and also I guess there's another consideration of that too, so there's location and um, something that we always have to take into consideration is that it's 45%, 45 percent of our service users have low or no literacy and that's to do with a really um, historic lack of access to education and there's some real barriers with education something we do a lot of work in supporting families and a lot of families do want to have their kids in education um, and it can sometimes be difficult to, to, to achieve that, bearing in mind um, other things in the background. Um, but so literacy is something really key. Of course, if you're going to send a written letter to someone um, and they can't read or write, then that's not going to be very helpful. So something that we would do quite often is um, we maybe would uh, read letters to people um, verbally or um, use like WhatsApp messages and things and do voice recordings. And there could be ways, I'm not sure within your own systems or whether you have that creativity basically that you can communicate with people in that way and stuff. 
then um, voice, voice recording some WhatsApp is quite a useful thing to do. Um, if we, we use our address as a care of address, and if someone comes to pick up letters, we often offer to read it through with them, not assuming that everyone can't read, because plenty of people, I mean, we know gypsies and travellers who've got PhDs and things, so it's not, it's not everybody at all, but just making sure that no one is left in that gap in between, um, and actively seeking out and, and, and looking for that. And I think it's full explanation, whatever service you're providing, make sure you are fully explaining to the, the if you do know they're a gypsy or a traveller, what it's about, because they will look at you as if they know they're understanding you, and they, they're not. They will walk out the door and they won't have an idea of what you've just said to them, because you're using jargon that they don't understand. And I think that can happen to most of us, actually, where yeah. health concerns <laughs> are. Um, so it's about making sure you're very clear with them. Yeah. Otherwise, they will walk out of that hospital before they've even had a treatment, because they're frightened immediately they go there. They don't understand, so they'll walk away. So it's about being very clear right from the very beginning with them. I think um, some, I personally, like I went for like a checkup recently and they give me uh, just my GP practice and they give me this long kind of letter thing and I find it like quite um, confusing to read and I read through health policy documents every day. So I was like, oh gosh, if I can't read this, it's not really a good sign and things. Then with that health, let's just think of making sure that people, you're telling things, messages people in, in a language they understand and kind of checking that and just taking time with that and things. Um, so for example, I know of um, a traveller family that we were working with um, who, who sadly lost, um, I was talking to the grandmother and, and they lost the, the, the grandchild at a really early stage as a baby uh, in the hospital. Um, and because of the way in which it was explained, it, it wasn't really explained in a way that the family had understood then I think the family came away from that experience thinking that the hospital had done something done something wrong and it was not a good hospital and they could not go back to that hospital sort of thing. So it, And then that kind of filters up through peer networks and things. People say, avoid XXX hospital um, sort of thing. So they have one hospital they constantly come back to um, near Brighton because they have had, um, every time they've had a child has been born there, the child has been fine. So that's been the kind of correlation because it is in that wider context of really what went wrong medically um, in their minds, then, then that's the only story that they leave with to get good care of them and that the hospital couldn't be trusted to look after a member of their family again um, and, and, and things like that can spread quite easily as well and um, so it does decrease trust in health professionals at the hospital even though <coughs> maybe um, in that situation it, it was nothing to do with the hospital the hospital had done everything perhaps and um, to, to help the child and things and um, so that's something yeah just to consider I guess as well so that kind of brings us on to the next point about building trust do you find the use of mobile phones has helped with communication in that you can do um, repeat information or second conversations yes. and you record things in that way? Because a lot of people now do have mobiles, even if they're yeah. you go and they're not on all time contacts. Yeah. Um, we actually just did some research in the summer about the digital inclusion in gypsy and traffic communities and we found lower levels of, of, of um, digital inclusion um, but still really quite reasonably good level sort of thing so the, the only there was it was one in five people that we spoke to so we interviewed 50 gypsies and travelers and the general population is one in 10 or one in 11 people have never used the internet or or connected digitally and things and amongst gypsy and travel communities it's one in five so there was more higher levels of digital inclusion but everyone who was in that bracket was over the age of 40 and everyone um had low or no literacy so I think it's, um, if you're able to identify, I often think a lot of families, maybe if someone can read and things, then maybe they might support with that, or someone might have access to mobile phone. I, I, would, I would be quite surprised if there was a, a bigger family and no one there had access to that. Um, so usually that's, that's a good way of yeah, communicating. So mobile phones are a really, really good asset um, that you can use. But they also use them to photograph their, their, their letters to us, and then we have to try and open it up <laughs> and see if we can read it back to them. Yeah. Uh, so they do use the mobile phone quite a bit. Um, mo to use the mobile to remind them about appointments is really important. Mm -hmm. um, they're not good at remembering appointments, uh, usually because there's lots going on around mm -hmm. them, especially if they're on the roadside. Uh, so if the text messages can be sent very brief, just the time date of the appointment, um, always assume they may not be able to read it, though there is usually a family member that can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's something that's maybe good to keep in mind then about um, yeah, about appointment making and setting and things. Then, um, so in gypsy and travel communities, there's really high levels of self-employment. People might work quite flexibly in things. So for me, um, I need to manage in a diary where I'm like, I need to be here, 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 like back-to-back -back meetings and things. But if people actually are using that skill on a daily basis and things, and actually the level of chaos with evictions or moving around, 
um, or going to get a job and that sort of stuff um, with, with work and things, then it might just make it quite difficult to manage appointments and things. So just um, if, there's, if you recognise that with the family when you're working with them, um, then not to think that it means that next time the family doesn't want to access your, your service or support, but it just could be other things happening in the background um, as well that just might things, make things more complex. Um, so yeah, that, that trust thing, I think a lot of it's about um, relationships and things. Um, that's, that's always going to be important. Um, it can be quite um, nerve-wracking to ask about people's cultures and traditions and things. Um, it can be, you don't know what to anticipate and where the differences might be and sometimes you might imagine that there's differences in places that there isn't any difference and not want to basically make a bit of a fool of yourself. <laughs> um, I think if you feel that there is a difference with somebody that you're, you're supporting or working with, just say, is there a cultural, do you have cultural um, concerns here? And then maybe they're open up. Because to say to somebody, are you a gypsy? They might see that as being offensive mm -hmm. and back off from you. Are you judging me? Mm -hmm. um, are you, is there something negative? Because they do hit a lot of negativity, mm -hmm. especially being on the roadside. Um, so maybe just ask if there is a cultural, um, they might not understand the word cultural, or do you have traditions? They don't always understand culture. Mm. So yeah, do you have tradition? And sometimes people might not even realise, um, for example, around the cremation example, do you want to go into that a bit about people not always realising what is a cultural thing and what isn't? Yeah, well, cremation's not usually one that they go towards. It would be burial, because you believe that um, you go out of this world as you come in. So you may not see some of them. Some of them do, obviously, wanted to be donors, because they would like the body to remain as it is. Mm -hmm. um, so burial would be a, a, a way forward with them, usually. And obviously there's lots of floral um, tributes and that. So, and where lots of people want to do the donation thing now, you'll find gypsies and travellers would do the floral thing, but they're probably doing the donation as well towards that charity of whatever that person's uh, died from. They do do a lot of charity work. Yeah, massively. Um, which is not known. <laughs> yeah, it's never in the papers. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, so sometimes, like for, for example, we might get someone um, phoning our helpline and saying, because um, they know we were obviously a pro gypsy traveller charity, so it's maybe a safe place to disclose that you're gypsy traveller because they know everyone not often say there is gypsy traveller themselves, or pretty um, probably wouldn't be doing the job unless they were pretty open to the cause sort of thing. Um, and for example, someone phoning up about, um, so like with, with state funerals, then the, the natural thing then to do would be that it would be a cremation and things. So someone would phone up and I think they hadn't quite realised that maybe for them that it was a cultural thing that they, they would rather be buried in something that is quite the norm within gypsy travel communities. But they, they hadn't recognised it and the person maybe on the other side of the process hadn't recognised that this was a cultural thing. Just because you don't, it's not an abstract thing that people are like, yep, I believe all these things, I do all these things, I am 100% uh, gypsy travel or cultural, like the, the, the image that you see sort of thing. Um, so trying to work out if you are experiencing like in your you feel like, oh, maybe we're not really, I'm not understanding why this is so important to you, then uh, thinking maybe it is culture and maybe also giving people the benefit of the doubt if they're not sure. Because it's very hard to quantify or prove that something's a cultural thing or not a cultural thing. Um, certainly sometimes we, we have to try to do that if you um, come up against somebody who's quite adversarial and uh, he's offering a public service. And it's, it's quite, hard, quite hard to quantify, but we know from speaking to, like we'll give sometimes expert, expert witness statements saying, this is the norm, da 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 da, da and have to back an individual up. But actually, if the person just trusted and listened to the person they were offering the service to, it would never really be an issue in the first place. And, and most of the time, it's not a huge ask that people are asking for, just for a slight um, change in the way a service is delivered. It was the bereavement. It's just about the cultural thing, because I really like the phrase, the last ones to know about the sea are the fish who swim in it. Yeah. And we're all swimming in our own culture. Well, that's just normal, isn't it? Yeah. And we don't actually see that it's different to somebody else's culture, even like family cultures. So, yeah. yeah, you know, I think it's a big ask to, to, to say to somebody, well, what are your traditions and cultures? They might be different. <laughs> I mean, if somebody asks me, I'd go, I don't know. <coughs> <laughs> where, where do you start sort of thing? Yeah. Um, and there's lots of overlaps between different cultures um, as well. I, I think, especially coming to later, the faith part of the presentation, I find that a lot of things that, that are um, cultural things from, from my family then, and maybe weren't cultural things from maybe um, loads of English families that I've met and things then we're also cultural things for gypsies and travellers and I kind of thought, I was like, how do I ever know? Because no one's ever just at this point where they're looking down at all the cultures and not part of one of themselves sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's just a trying to, it's a more of an art than a science, <laughs> I think. Um, so yeah, building trust about um, culture and traditions and uh, not making assumptions. Um, this is something um, that I guess is just really important. Um, we've had people come out to service providers um, with us to gypsy and traveller sites 
um, and ask questions in front of um, community members and things like, oh, well, do they pay rent for this? For this land? Yes, um, people are paying for their, for their stuff, they expect to pay for a house and things. Um, nothing's free these days, is it? Um, do gypsies and travellers pay taxes? Yes, most gypsies and travellers pay taxes and those sort of things. And um, have heard something, some sort of Chinese whisper somewhere, or some sort of something, um, I don't know what's in the press, these, these recurring ideas and things. And actually, you don't even realise that you believe these things sometimes until you're in a situation where you're, you're actually standing in front of a gypsy or traveller and then you realise, gosh, how stupid was that to ever think of that, do you know what I mean? Um, so not, not trusting in those things. Um, and if you've seen something in my big fat gypsy wedding, then probably just ignore it. <laughs> it's a good thing to do. I think, I think sometimes though it's such a closed community, it's very hard for people on the outside to actually have an understanding mm. of inside. So in, in that way it does it breeds exactly what you're saying, that sort of yeah. Chinese whisper effect. Yeah. I think you're right as well, because if it because it is so close, yeah. The only experiences mm. that we tend to have, like um, Faye and I from Manchester Royal, and we had the Traveller family earlier on in the year that was all over the local press, <coughs> um, because all their vans were just parked outside in no parking bays, mm. um, and there was a huge backlash um, yeah. against them. And from, from people who have no experience yeah. of, of Travellers as a community, yeah. apart from this one, yeah. um, you can almost see why people were saying, well, I can't park mine in a car there, why can't I park <coughs> theirs there? Yeah. Why can they have 30 people at the bedside when I'm only allowed two? Yeah. Um, and it's because you don't have that other side, because as you said, it is such a close yeah. tight community that yeah. we never see the other side. Yeah, I think we, we, all, um, we all think that someone's getting more of the pie than we are, yeah. like just a bit of a human mm. feeling, isn't it? Mm. And, and that's going to be the, the, the feeling for patients. Um, and for everyone else, I think when you think of numbers wise, I think actually one of the reasons why I mean most people in this room said they had they hadn't worked with a, a gypsy and traveller family, and I don't know if people in the room have actually met gypsies and travellers themselves or have known that they have. I'm sure you have, but you just didn't realise it. Not, not that everyone walks around saying like I'm this or I'm that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's such a small community, like three hundred thousand isn't big in the grand scale of the yeah. UK and stuff. So you're always just going to get that with a smaller group. There's going to be misunderstandings and things. So it's trying to anticipate those and um, plan for them and try to understand the yeah. people around you. Do we offer sort of like health and education links into the sites that are based? Do we, do we have actually professionals going in to try and educate and speak about health education to the community? Yeah. Well, this is a big part of your job, isn't it? You can really yeah. tell them more. Yeah, um, we have outreach across Sussex. Yeah. And that's what we do. We go out okay. to the families mm -hmm. and we support them, we take them into services. Um, and while we're taking them into services, we're explaining about the culture at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but that's only across Sussex. They say not in the Manchester, not happening in the There are, there are right. groups up here, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. In, so we have like a, on our website, if you're ever looking to get in touch with like a local um, gypsy and travel organisation, you might have like local links to the community you're in. Then we've got on our website, and we'll share loads of resources afterwards, we can maybe email them through, and maybe you guys can email them around and stuff as well. And um, we've got a service directory of all the gypsy and travel organisations, there's around 50. Providing that we know of that are providing support to different travel communities. Some of those are things like Health Watch do some um, outreach work in Kent. There's um, uh, British Red Cross do it, I think it's in um, Birmingham and things. There's different cities have different lines. We won't know about them all, but we know about some of them definitely. So there, are, there are things there. It's, it depends on how they're being commissioned locally, mm -hmm. whether people are considering vulnerable populations in their commissioning and things. The gypsies and travellers do often get left off the map. Yeah. Um, but in some cases, there's really fantastic practice happening, so it really is a postcode lottery, really. Um, so I think I might be speaking out of turn, mm -hmm. I don't in any way want to, there might be something out there, but we struggled to find somebody local mm -hmm. that could come and speak, and yeah. not in any way, so that's, you know, obviously yeah. not why we didn't get to you first, but we did struggle for somebody, yeah, yeah, and okay. I apologise mm -hmm. if we've over, you know, over, just lost sight of somebody locally, but it was hard to find. Yeah, yeah. And then actually everybody referred, that I spoke to referred to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But we do work nationally. We've got yeah. a helpline that's yeah. national. So anything that comes in, we'll do our best to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've got like a specific question and there isn't someone locally to deal with, you can phone our helpline and we'll give you advice about that specific case mm -hmm. and things um, to um, recognising that the country is really, really patchy. We will have a bit of a more digger one. There's not anyone who jumps to mind. I mean, there's not loads of stuff happening in Manchester, but I'll, I'll do a proper digger run and see if I can find anyone that I can suggest that would be a good contact. We certainly have permanent sites. Yes, yeah. we do yeah. have permanent yeah. sites. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going yeah. to do, was that link of going in and talking to the community. Yeah. 
and they would be run by the council. So they should have a liaison team, yeah. yes. usually, yes. which are people to contact mm. if you need to access mm. the sites. Yeah. Mm. Historically, there would have been travel education services across the country. You would have gone out and um, I reached on the sites mm -hmm. and have a link to school, which were also good contact points. Mm -hmm. Depending on the commissioner locally, then some of those have dropped out because it's not right. the Ministry of National okay. anymore and things. We'll definitely have a little look and see if we can send out some information about anything local. Mm -hmm. Is everyone from the kind of Manchester or Greater Manchester area here? Um, we do have travellers on a regular basis, but we don't have a, an official sign. In Warrington? Yeah, but I do. I think the, the, there's like a community police officer link, I think, mm. but I'm not sure about the help. Mm. 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 Oh, we'll have a little look then for Warrington and then for Manchester, Greater Manchester, and we can send that friend afterwards. Does that sound okay? Mm. Um, yeah, that's, that's useful to know who it is. Um, it's always really obvious, I think, when there's this, like a civil society or a uh, voluntary sector yeah. organisation like there, because they're often quite vocal and you're able to think of them in lots of places. <laughs> um, so hopefully we, hopefully there's something there, or maybe it's something that could be commissioned if there's individuals in the ground that all rally behind. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, is there any other questions at this point at all that anyone has? We rattle our heads. Um, so we can talk a bit about um, preferences, preferences around end of life care. Um, now this, this is something that there's some, uh, my big fact you see when it gets right in a way. Um, you'll see there, um, families coming together are really, um, really strong focus on extended family and things. Um, within gypsy and travel communities then, and even within Roma communities as well, um, then people tend to look after each other in, a, in an extended family sort of way, where everyone's <coughs> kind of involved in each other's lives and things. Families might travel around together as well. Um, and certainly when it comes to end of life care, um, then I guess what you'll have experienced and things then at end of life care generally means well that family will become quite involved in that process. Um, and that, that comes with them um, some really positive, really um a really a really big asset of gypsy and travel communities in terms of a support network and having a lot of people around to support with lots of different parts of the care and things. And it might come with some really practical challenges then um, on your on for, for you as well and in terms of how can you support that in a good way, how can you allow someone um, then to have that real personal support network really empowered in that and how does that work with um, other patients um, wherever you are working? Um, and maybe perhaps you can talk about uh, about the extended family and any cases you've advocated on around uh, fa family coming in. Um, yeah. <coughs> how that's worked and how it has some work sometimes maybe as well. You'll, you'll find that there will be influx of family when there's a wedding, when there's a christening, when there's, um, what did the Roman Catholics have? The, is it the the communion as yeah. well. Yeah. Oh, we've got so many things. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously when there's end of life, um, they will all come in because they will want to be with that person or to try and speak to that person before they pass. Um, and that has to be managed. Mm -hmm. um, because that is part of the culture. Um, they don't like anybody going out of this world alone. So there will always be a family member with them. Mm -hmm. um, if it can be managed, then that's, that's fabulous. Um, and they are, they're pretty respectful. You will get some families that can't manage their emotions. So maybe that is where you need to take them to a, a quieter space and perhaps talk things through with them. Um, I've always found Macmillan, uh, Mary Carey, people like that, are, if it is around cancer or that, are really good at sitting and talking through emotions with people and to keep them calm. Um, obviously, there's lots more other health issues that um, if there are other charities that can come in and be with the family to sort of help them that would be great um, but it is part of the culture it is something that will happen um, we like to think that local authorities will be more tolerant when these groups come in together usually if they're on a site um, we have a permanent site and a transit site so when there are these celebrations or these bereavements going on the transit site will be used for the extended family but not all areas have got this sort of facility so they will be on the roadside and the only reason why travellers are on the roadside is because there isn't enough permanent and transit sites they don't want to be there any more than anyone else it's a very dangerous place to be especially for the children and that um, so if there can be some form of toleration within the local authorities, then it's greatly appreciated. With them, um, in terms of like how does that look and things, because it'd be quite, I guess it would be something that your, your, your bread and butter, your daily tasks that you're, you're doing, you're going to be jumping into this probably every so often, maybe as a family comes in. 
then there's an organisation I'm also put this in the resources as well. I'm starting to get around. It's called Leeds Gift. They are um, they've been pushing this thing in, in Leeds. Surprise, surprise with the name. Um, and the, uh, they're, they're really pushing for a national rollout. It's called Negotiate the Stopping. And um, so it would be like an agreement between the local authority um, and the family about like how long they can stay in a place, and then the local authority will come in and bring out like refuge and that sort of thing. And often what they'll do is they'll direct people away from like contentious places like car parks mm -hmm. and public parks and things and direct a family towards a spot that maybe they can stay for a bit longer and it won't really affect anyone around them and won't create any sort of um, lack of community cohesion and things. So that would be a good thing maybe if, if you if you do come across a gypsum travel family, you recognise that's people going to come down. Probably whether you like it or not, a lot of families are just going to be coming anyway, so it's just about how do you manage that. Um, basically, is it, is it good or bad sort of thing. Um, if you're able to contact the local authority and say, no, we should have stopped, it's a good way of doing this. There's, um, there's loads of like, there's a bit of academic reviews of it things, and it's fine to like, save costs and help community cohesion and things. So it's, it's not just a kind of random charity that said, let's do this thing. It's um, quite an established principle. And actually, it's based upon what Gypsy Travel has been doing for centuries, which is just landing in a local place and then negotiating with local people. But sometimes when you put um, an official title on it, it just helps local authorities to see it as being a more, um, a more of a real thing and a more tangible thing and something that they can engage with. Um, I think they've become more visible because there isn't the agricultural side of things anymore. The farms aren't allowed to take the gypsum travellers on to let them do the uh, seasonal work. So they're more visible now. They're out there. They're not allowed to be on the common areas anymore. It's a, they've been outlawed. So you're seeing them more. And a bigger thing, biggest thing of all with this is rubbish. People always say about the rubbish. Um, again, we have known local authorities to provide bins. And for them, they will use the bins. Mm -hmm. And to provide toilets, porto loos, they will use those toilets. If for some reason that local authority won't provide those, then speak to that group and ask them, are they prepared to pay? And maybe collectively they would pay for that, those facilities. They don't like this sort of thing any more than anyone else. Um, but I think a lot of people feel that, oh, that they've been here again, the rubbish they've left. That's because they've been moved so quickly. And what are you going to think of? Where you're going to sleep for the night or clearing that rubbish? Um, maybe you can talk a little bit, because it's the next point there is about um, food and people bringing their own food in and things about bleaching and those different things, the yeah. some practices. Could you talk about that maybe? I don't know if you've had that experience, that you will find some families will bring their own food in. We find an awful lot of families, <laughs> whether travelling families or not, will bring oh, that's food good. Into, <laughs> our <laughs> our <laughs> into our hospital. Yeah. Um, Including I, me, my granddaughter's in at the moment, and I've been taking me in for my daughter. Right, well that, that's, yeah. that does happen, because they won't trust yeah. other people's cooking. Yeah. Um, they don't perhaps cook traditionally. Yeah. Uh, we do have a, a recipe book uh, that is, you're able to go online and, and view and also purchase um, but that's sort of basic meals of what they do eat um, it's very old traditional ones um, but so yeah it's that idea of cooking over a fire and things is it is that quite a big aspect of traveling cooking would you say it could have been <laughs> yeah um, and the fire is still very much a big thing for when somebody passes that they often will have burn a fire outside even if they're in housing mm -hmm. Uh, so again, they have to get uh, permission from the council, whoever it is they may be renting from, unless they're on their own land. Um, and that's a part of sitting up with the uh, deceased and not letting them be on their own all the time leading up to the funeral. So usually it's the men that will stay out around the farm, women tend to collect inside, um, and they are all together. Do you ever find that they come in and they're using your facilities for tea and coffee quite a bit? Um, and Usually they do replace that. Are you not finding that? Um, I'll be honest. I don't know because I'm not based on a ward. Um, yeah. We have a we uh, the the palliative care service, so we we uh, just go to wards as we're needed. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, um, they do. But most of our kitchens now will have a lock on. Um, but what we find is that our we, we have some really really good housekeepers who will keep people plied with tea um, and coffee and such like and again it's not just the travel fees yeah. so the, the, the you know we, we have I, I wouldn't say it's any one community or another we, we have lots of people who families will you know use the facilities yeah and replenish 
No, perhaps put a note up then. <laughs> yeah. No, we do usually find that yes. if we go into a hospital somewhere, we will replace yeah. what we've used yeah. because it's out of respect for the fact that they've allowed us to use their facilities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even perhaps buy them some cups or yeah. mm. crockery or that to say thank you. Um, so that happens quite a bit. Um, what else was it you wanted to cover? About um, bleaching cups and oh. things and that sort of stuff, especially around end of life care. Yeah. Um, it's it's all about the cleanliness. So you, if you go into, I don't know what it was like when you went into the um, caravan you went into, but invariably they've usually got muslin cloths about. They're bleached. Everything is bleached down. Cups, everything, um, and that's because we don't believe in cross contamination. You'll find that I don't know if you've ever noticed that their trailers are cleaned outside, inside on a very regular basis, and because of that. Uh, belief of cross-contamination, it stops a lot of diseases. And you'll find that a lot of gypsy travellers have not had the diseases that some uh, folk have had because of that cleanliness. And it's even higher when it comes to um, the bereavement time. Uh, and families are coming in and they're giving them tea, coffee all week long and everything is bleached down. So you'll find a high smell of bleach. <laughs> I'm surprised they haven't done it in your kitchens then. <laughs> it's not bad then, it's quite handy. Yeah. Um, so I think with maybe also common with a lot of, um, with a lot of communities, people often prefer home care until um, it gets to really kind of the, the last final stages when they really have to go into kind of a clinical sort of setting. Um, so yeah, it is to keep that into mind and things. Um, and then also that gypsies and travellers might have preferences around the gender of the person who's caring for them. Um, so obviously with things that are more sensitive, that are more related to like women's health and men's health and things, then that preference will become more distinct and stronger. Um, but then also particularly with cars and things, then women tend to look after women and men often look after men and things, um, which is again, a lot, a lot of communities are the same. Um, and um, I guess it just requires that conversation to see how, what people's preferences are and how you can best support these preferences with the resources that you've got there. Um, so that's useful to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, how, how can you support um, the extended family involvement? Um, so as we said before, it's common for extended family to travel to the place where the loved one is to offer support and pay respects. Sometimes, um, from what I've picked up over the years in FFT, is if sometimes you'll have a really um, quite well-known community member, they might have uh, huge dreams of people and there'll be different amounts um, according to the wishes of the person who's really ill. Um, or according to just how, how, how linked that family is with lots of different families and things. So it's good probably to talk about what does the family expect and how many people does that individual um, want to have involved in that process? Is that, is that hundreds? Is that ten? And things, and that will greatly, greatly help you to understand what scale of, um, of work you're kind of dealing with, I guess, then. Um, and then, as I said before, about uh, communicating with local authorities and things. And um, particularly around times of, um, like when it comes to the point with, with the funeral and things as well, then sometimes we'll find local families that communicate um, with, with police and things too because if there's if there's hundreds of people coming to congregate in one place and police haven't anticipated that it can um, mean that roads are cut off and things but how can they plan that process and things too. Quite sadly, um, sometimes when there's gypsy and travel funerals in town, uh, the local pubs hear about it and all the pubs shut down because of that fear that people are going to come in um, and trash the place and things. So it's, it's looking at um, yeah, if, uh, what, what are the way that people want to, 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 to celebrate or mark the occasion um, or, or to pay respects to the loved one, whatever it is that they are choosing to do and things, um, and, and what services will they need in place and who needs to be informed and stuff about that as well. Um, yeah, it could be that as a health professional, um, you, you might find that you might, you might be like, oh, is it, is it for me to ask this and things and stuff? But probably the sooner you have that conversation, you'll feel more, far more confident, the family will feel far more like they know what they can expect from you and what level of support and things you're able to offer them and things too. So to have that conversation quite early on, um, will hopefully make the process easier um, for, for, for everyone who's involved in things um, and will make it means you have a, a strong message of what's going to happen to all the different um, authorities and things here around. Um, and then again, that practical consideration, so if the, if the family have nowhere to stop, um, well, there's, there's going to be somewhere that they're going to find to stop and things. And how do you communicate to someone, say, if the care of the person maybe is, is, is on an unauthorised site and is moving around to, just make sure you've got good communication and they know how to get hold of you and vice versa if they miss an appointment and those sort of things. Um, and that kind of brings us, we've already kind of talked about this now, uh, the Mockady laws around cleanliness. Um, so that was about, um, about the, the bleaching things and keeping things very clean. Um, then about uh, having one bowl for washing, 
um, washing up in one bowl for like washing the body and things, so kind of separating those things out. Um, about animals and, and domestic pets and things, um, not being in that kind of domestic area house, maybe they would be living outside. That will differ according to each family and things. Um, like everyone's just, just quite different. There'll be a spectrum. Some people are very traditional and think absolutely no. Some people think, well, actually, I'd quite like my dog to be inside with me at this point and that sort of stuff. So just anticipating that there might be some small differences there. Um, and then uh, there might be that fear. Uh, we get this when we're working um, around uh, like domestic violence if someone's going into a, a hostel and things um, or a refuge and stuff. Um, and maybe it will be the same thing with the hospice is that people might be worried that they actually can't stick to the levels of or <coughs> seven or four will be resistant to going to that place and things. So um, if you are experiencing some um, some issues where people are quite resistant to what you think really needs to happen for their health at that point, then trying to work out what's the underlying issue for that and recognising that it might not just it might not be um, just a absolute like not wanting your service, but there could just be real quite real considerations um, culturally that need to be taken into account. Um, and yeah, so I think Apple's kind of covered a lot of that. Um, it makes me really sad that a lot of the press coverage of gypsies and travellers is about rubbish and about uncleanness because it's so far, so incredibly far from actually um, how really, really clean that the most gypsies and travellers are um, and that really, really high level um, of that. So it's kind of, yeah. It's, it's, it's a bit dumb about the gypsy weddings yeah. that, that they really hit home about hats because they were just fantastically clean. Yeah, and yeah. Maybe really like right? gleaming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope that no one ever sees my house. <laughs> I, th I think the negative thing about the big fat gypsy wedding is is the flamboyance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've been yeah. paid a lot of money to do this, and so the girls have gone for it, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. And they've got these huge dresses <laughs> and things, and everyone's looking and thinking, that's so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But you've been given this lump of money, mm -hmm. you're going to do it. That's your dream day, isn't yeah. it? So, yeah. But a lot of the men, I don't know if you noticed, don't get involved with it. They don't want to be part of the... I don't think that's just specific to... <laughs> <laughs> My little girl would turn up, would, would want a dress like that. Yes. Um, absolutely, you know, give her that money, she would turn up yeah. a dress like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wish... This is a lot of gypsies that didn't want to get involved in it because yeah. they didn't like that side of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think sometimes... Um, I don't know, I seen like it was a, a local politician in Brighton was like saying, all oh, these gypsies and travellers pulling up and they're like Land Rovers in their flashy cars in our local parks, almost implying that it was wrong to be rich and be gypsy or travelling, because why should gypsies and travellers be allowed to be rich? And um, why have they got the big cars? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because they've got a trailer of caravan. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you also compare that with the, the expense of a mortgage for a house, it's quite um, different amounts of money and things, so mm. I think that they're anticipating as well that actually maybe what we see in TV might make you think that all gypsies and travellers are really rich, but there is, there's real poverty within mm -hmm. um, some members of gypsy and travel communities not all own things. But just anticipating that just because someone's got a flash car doesn't actually mean they have loads of money. It's actually though uh, all, all, all people's possessions might be quite visible and yeah. um, things too. Um, so there might be other yeah, issues there too that you might want to consider and things that come with not having enough money around that, that, that time of life can be a, an incredibly stressful thing. Um, so yeah, the thing we talked about before, like how can you make how can you make the environment that you have as, as welcoming as possible to someone? How can you make someone feel at home in somewhere that isn't their home? Um, and that was about people bringing in food and stuff as well. Um, so we've got that traveller recipe book that was developed with gypsy travellers and healthy recipes um, and just kind of traditional old classic recipes and things. So I'm looking at that and said, like, what will, um, is this something someone we can do to facilitate this to happen and things? I think the resources of every place will be quite different in terms of what they can the members that can make. Sometimes some things that we do, uh, we, we, there's like a magazine and we'll send a link for it as well and you can order copies of it called The Traveller's Times. So it's like a traveller, a magazine about different traveller culture and events around like the horse furs and that sort of stuff. Having like little small things that are just kind of cultural cues and things mm -hmm. that just try to make, just say I'm really thinking about you and I'm trying to think about how, how I can make this as, as nice as possible. There's small things but they can make a big difference I think. And then it's just coming back to asking either that individual or a few individuals in the family you've got a relationship with, like what, what can we do to change this environment to be more like someone that's like home and things. Um, and just to, to consider that, because it's, it's hard to do if you if you come from a different background from someone to know what that would look like, and not just to do kind of um, like things that are very sur very surface level things, but small things they, they can make a difference. Um, you talked about um, people's perceptions being incorrect and about prejudice yeah. that's coming from this side against travellers. Yeah. Have you found similar kind of prejudices from travellers against people who are non-travellers? There's, I mean, I think there could be a there's a fear barrier, isn't there? There's a fear barrier, yeah. This fear, this fear that um, 
So the, the word for non-travellers, if you are a gypsy traveller, is like a gorgia, so I'm Abba Gorgia. Um, and uh, fears around um, whether people will be listened to and respected and stuff. And I think um, but integration goes both ways, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, it's, it's both communities that are involved in that process in some way and things. Um, so it's not something that um, I wouldn't say that it's a general big thing that we deal with all the time. Um, but I think most people just feel a bit understood and have misconceptions about people they don't spend loads of time with and things. So that, that, that can run both ways and it just takes a really friendly face and a really kind and kind person to break through that. Right, or people can believe um, uh, you, you can be the exception to that rule if people do think that way. <laughs> but I, I don't. I wouldn't say it's a really commonly, um, a really common anticip a commonly anticipated thing. Mm. Um, I've never had anyone we work with lots of gypsy travellers. Never had anyone I feel being prejudiced against me in that sense. So I would have expected that maybe by now after a few years of working in no, that environment. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I think that when you said about the, the children going to play. Mm, yeah. Sure that's about that's you know if because I actually. It, that wouldn't particularly bother me if I had a girl going to play, but yeah. would, would they come back to us? Because that's, you know, as children, that's what they want. If I see yeah. your bedroom, you see my bedroom, and yeah. they'd be quite happy to come back into our situation. Well, we've got a permanent site uh, that's been there for just about two years now, and they're just beginning to invite friends back from school. Right. Mm. Um, and it's only the odd ones, mm. um, which is good that that's starting to develop. But that's worked because we've got Home Club there, which is about helping young uh, travellers settle into school. It's about supporting them with their school. We've got a young girls group, we've got a boys group. We take them into table tennis. So we've worked on integration. And from that, it's now encouraging them to invite people in. Because people are very blocked. Um, you, you know, you go up to a school, and this uh, parent standing groups anyway, <clears throat> but you invariably see the travelling parents are sitting in their vehicles or they're further back. The other, family, other mums are further forward. So it's about encouraging them into the school. So that's what we do. We encourage them to go into the school, to be parts of meetings, go to the parents' evenings and that. Um, and it's, they're big steps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you've not had education, well. yeah, if, you've, if you're an adult that's not had education, mm -hmm. not attended school that much, but you want your children to, mm -hmm. as a big step, mm -hmm. to walk into that school to discuss education when you don't even understand it. It's intimidating, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I think, um, like, so I grew up in Belfast, and there's the kind of divide between um, Catholic and Protestant communities, and um, like, as a kid and things, then you might have some uh, conception, misconceptions about how the other community is, but then given the chance of an individual, then you, you realise that that's all just stupid and means really nothing in the, in the grand scale. So I think in, in that sense, that people are. When you meet someone and you know they're, they're kind and stuff, then people will reciprocate and things, but it's just about being invited to someone's house and being invited to someone's site and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's just important. And I really hope that that's something that will improve over the years and things mm -hmm. as well, because that's really how we can challenge misconceptions through relationships, through education and those sort of things. It's, 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 um, it's almost a shame that it comes to the level where there's a crisis or there's, a, there's something happening for that to, those two cultures to kind of yeah. uh, meet and for people to gain understanding about them. Yeah. Um, I think that was one of the... the, the the sorry things about when the, the story of the, the family only one in the year hit the press because the whole story wasn't yeah. the um, and I think that, that was that was you know this this it, it was a, an, an exceptional set of circumstances yeah. as what to, was that story but I don't know um, it was um, <coughs> we had a, a gentleman from the travel traveller community uh, it was only young in his forties he had a massive heart attack yeah. um, was on intensive care um, and what happened was a number of the family members had actually parked where the ambulance fares are at the front oh, of the right. hospital um, and it's no parking you need the ambulance access so then somebody had gone to the press saying you know if an ordinary member of Joe Public had parked here they mm -hmm. would have been fined they would have been clamped and they would have been hauled off and all the rest of it um, and yes I understand that mm -hmm. but in this family there was actually a big family event going on. So family members had come from yeah. all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't as if this had just happened on a, on a normal everyday day. Mm -hmm. And as she said, you know, everybody wants to come. He, in fact, did he? Did he die? Did he? I yeah, I think he, mm -hmm. he did die. I think it took him a while to die. Yeah. I think it took him about a month. 
Um, so of course everybody was coming up, but there were only that volume of people there because there was already a big family yeah. event going on in the first place. But what that wasn't reported in the local press, it was just about all these traveller families. Yeah, and they just seem to get a lot of negative press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and the people were complaining that they were going in and using the bathrooms to have a wash and things in the morning. Well, yeah, it's bathroom. Yeah, wooden <laughs> gym. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a sink, there's toilets, yeah. and towels and emergencies. Yes, yeah. you've got a lovely broad way yeah. of thinking, lovely. I've seen that in the press, isn't it? I've seen that in the press, and I guess that's something then, it's quite a, it's quite a scary thing then for, for like a, a hospital, things, that situation, mm -hmm. like how do you respond to that and things, mm -hmm. like um, what statement do you put out and things, because first of all you want to reassure that the, 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 the population know why, that everyone has access to the same health yeah. that we all yeah. are looked at and da 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 when it's culturally, when to treat everyone um, like in an equitable way doesn't mean you treat everyone the same, isn't it? But that's quite hard to get across to, like, yeah. I think it was in the sun and stuff, yeah. um, and things, because they don't want to hear these messages, yeah. they want to have, yeah. they want to want a headline that says someone else's son is getting more, yeah. and, just, and just give, but that's kind of what, um, what I mean, that's, that's not a story, yeah. if it's just, we're providing really good yeah. care to yeah. a man who's really sick, but they yeah. wouldn't be reporting on it, yeah. and things. Um, so the press isn't always the, the best friend of, I think, a lot of minority groups, Gypsies and travellers and chicken get quite a bad time yeah. in the press. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if there's any statements that you're able to release around that, or if there's someone, if there's a comms department and things, then that could be quite a good and positive thing to do to give some more information out of things and to reaffirm um, that family and things that they should be receiving some treatment. I mean, there's some things that maybe, um, I mean, reaffirm it where you are giving people that support and, um, and that sort of thing. So just finding that balance, it's tough. It's really tough. Um, and the press aren't always the funnest people to deal with. Yeah. Um, I say it's the person who does their press engagement at <laughs> FFT. Um, so yeah, no, that 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 provides good context. Um, so then the next do thing. Do you want to have a break or oh, yeah. to carry us through what people want to do? Take five minutes. Just a five minute star yeah. jump. Yeah. <laughs> star <laughs> jump. <laughs> <laughs> to then is about um, providing end of life, quality end of life care at home. Um, so I guess I, I imagine a few people in the room maybe will be involved in that um, here. Um, so then I, I think one of the the, so the, the, the the key consideration here is where is home for people then. So it's, we went through that about um, size, about housing, um, and about people here moving you really want to advocate for someone to get onto a, a permanent site or a, a transit site where they can stay for longer and things or at least until um, things do kind of the works um, and then putting in the services that, that need to happen there um, so if you um, if you something we were talking about earlier on um, it, might, it might be um, for some people a bit nerve wracking just to walk on to a gypsy or traveller site and kind of work out like it's not like one to ten and all the houses in a row sort of thing um, so it's like um, what homes things might be scattered so it's like who lives where I know when I'm at a traveller site and things if I'm going into somebody then I'm about like I don't really know where this person is you don't want to walk around like a bit of an Egypt asking everyone like where is this person and also you might not want to let on that um, you might not want to disclose the fact that, <coughs> that person is a shaking end of land curse so there's some confidentiality issues and things there um, so kind of quite a practical thing you can do is ask someone can you make me get a front entrance where I can find my home is um, and then you can walk to it together and things, and then they can choose whether they disclose people on the way to their home if people are asking who you are or anything. Um, then that's quite a practical way you can deal with that. And think, uh, I would I'd like to think most people would be would be fine with that. Um, traveller sites are like um, like all all communities and areas. There's some areas that there's some that there's some that would be really welcome and really friendly, absolutely no issue, no racist behaviour, no crime or anything. And you the odd street or traveller site that might be a bit more scary to walk down and things, especially at night time and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's often dogs kind of my um yeah, so, so, so around a bit more. Yeah. This was my one of my big I lived in Romania for a few years working in over community and the dogs just absolutely terrified me. Um because they didn't they didn't maybe act the same way as the, the dogs maybe that I was used to back in Belfast and things and I just was a bit scared of dogs anyway. Um so maybe if you if you if you have fear of dogs or if you're worried about a dog being off the lead and stuff, um they say to the family you're coming to visit that you're afraid of the dog and that's all the issue sort of thing. And that you might want um supervision for that. <laughs> Um, and I think most people will accommodate for that, especially if you're coming in to help them at such an important time and things. Um, then uh, it might be sometimes as well if you go into someone's home and different family members are coming in now because maybe they're living with lots of people, it might be hard to keep up with who's doing things, but you'll learn it, you'll learn it before long. Um, I work with extended families, and if I'm in someone's home and they will have family members coming in and out, I just stop. And that person will come in and I'll look and I'll say, well, is it all right if I continue? And they'll say yes or no, or they might give you a look. Mm -hmm. And you think, no, all right, we'll keep this as a, just a conversation. Wait till they've left, and then we'll continue what we're doing. So your visit may take a bit longer than usual. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's just letting them know that you're aware that there's confidentiality here. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I continue? They'll either say yes or no. Or they'll give you that look of no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you'll, yeah, so also I guess that people will learn as they go along with things, just step into a slightly new environment. Um, nothing that no one here can't handle. <laughs> um, and then uh, something, especially for families new to the area, so if they have been travelling around for quite a while and actually haven't lived in Manchester before, they might not know what anything is at all. Um, so words you might say, yeah, just next to the train station or something, that might ask, mean absolutely nothing to somebody. Um, and also people might not be aware of special services, or they might not be, they might not be aware that. I mean, although the services are for everyone, sort of thing, people might not, like, they might not think actually, we really, I could go there and receive good um, mm -hmm. services and treatment. Um, so something we'll often do if we're signposting people to services and things, we'll um, maybe introduce them to the person that they're going to be engaging with. Um, and then if we, if we see any potential, like sometimes services aren't actually that well equipped to deal with gypsy travel communities, they might not be able to uh, communicate with someone um, through WhatsApp or, or like whatever, whatever it is, there might be some quite structural issues you might want to overcome that you can maybe say, oh, um, either if you have some ideas of how they can make sure that can work in a good way, do that, or if you want to phone us and we can try to advise them if we have some specific advice for a specific service, um, we're happy to do that for you, so please do give us a shout if that just becomes difficult at all. Um, and then we'll often maybe do like a phone call later on and just check it's all going okay, phone, phone the client and say, did that service work okay for you and things? Um, because just things, yeah, yeah, I think just sometimes things don't go as planned. Um, We've known GPs not to register travelling families mm -hmm. because they've got no postcode. Uh, but that is actually illegal, and we can challenge that. Yeah. So there was a there was a survey done in two thousand and sixteen by British Red Cross, and it was um, a Romani a, a family who called themselves Ro Romanian Gypsies, a family called Romanian Roma, and a family who were Ro English Gypsy, and they tested out twenty five services in Birmingham, twenty five GP <laughs> practices, and only only forty percent of those GP practices successfully registered them, um, and something that through our policy work we're really trying to change. Like it's a, I think it's quite an urgent thing. Um, so that that is really important if people don't have um, people don't have ID. Uh, sometimes people are asked to prove if they've been travelling abroad or something. They might be asked to prove their immigration status. People sh sh they shouldn't be asking those things. And receptionists are breaking uh, guidance from NHS England when they're asking those. But it happens regularly and it happens with homeless communities and everything yeah, as well. They do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so it's um, yeah. Please do advocate. The more health professionals um, and general medicine people who, who know rights around that, the better. Um, so I think um, something that came in recently was um, we had someone approach us who had um, a lump on her breast, she wanted to do a GP practice to get registered and to get um, a scan and things and absolutely GP practice, so it was an absolute battle to get it done, she knew all her rights, she was completely literate, absolute battle to get it done, finally got the screening done, there was nothing wrong, um, over the next couple of years she felt like it was growing and stuff and she really, um, she just wasn't up for that fight again and was like well last time it came back as negative do you really want to go through that whole rigmarole just to be told again you don't have it and by the time then that she went to got diagnosed um, her, her cancer had advanced quite a lot she had cancer and it advanced quite a lot of things so actually her feelings towards her GP practice now are, are understandably quite negative um, and there's, there, there will be there will be I think situations like that where people have been refused basic health care and have ended up really ill because um, not because of actually like lack of their want of trying to access things but if the way they've been treated in the past health professionals, that, that is going to carry over in things. So it's reassuring people that, that, that they won't receive that level of treatment there. And also as, as part of like end of life care and in terms of rectifying people feeling abuse of the world, you might actually want some people to challenge those things where they've happened, where actually that's contributed to their health. 
and stuff. People might not be aware of kind of complaints processes and things, um, and how they can go about that. And there might be some knowledge you just have as as health professionals and things that will help that you could just trip people's way and they can actually go through that process themselves and stuff. Um, so recognizing people might have had really um, quite poor experiences of that. Um, yeah, if that's an issue, if someone's moved to a new area and they can't get right to the GP practice, feel free to give our help out a phone, we'll help advocate for them, or if you're able to do that for yourself, then, then please do. Often it just takes someone with a professional title, and GP practices will make everything work, but um, uh, the individual on the ground, especially if they lack understanding of their rights or the right terms to use and things to get what they need, then um, won't have such a, such a good outcome. Um, so yeah, the services people could tap into, um, and then addressing fear around visiting sites at Topaz, we talked about that a little bit. Um, if you're supporting someone who's a boater, then likely they're on a canal and you might have to go to towpath to get to them and if they're continuous cruising, they might move quite a lot of things. So things like um, like you can use on like um, WhatsApp and on iPhones and things and on Messenger, like you can share locations, so that might help you to find someone, might, might be possible, uh, might be easier or you can ask them to send a friend or they can come out if they're um, able-bodied and able to come out and meet you. Um, so those are all kind of practical things you can do. Um, when you don't have an address, different like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this was a there's a piece of research done. This this um, it was re it was re launched this year, but it was done in 2017 um, by two I think it was profession uh, professors in social work, um, and they they did um, they did some training with children services social workers. Um, and they asked them, we've, we've had a lot of um, engagement with children's services over the years, sometimes people have been um, quite um, quite scared uh, about gypsy travel families, un unsure how to engage with them, anticipating more risks where there isn't risks at all, um, and things. And um, these researchers, they interviewed lots of social workers and they asked them, um, so there's the child protection social workers and um, they've been told there's a domestic disturbance and an address and they showed a picture of just a, a regular kind of suburb street. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you feel about going to this place? Da, 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 da. So she worker said, yeah, this is like my bread and butter, this is my job, this is what I do all the time, no problem, I can go there. And then when they were showing a picture of a gypsy and traveller site, people said that they felt like scared, they weren't really sure what to do, and they felt out of their depth, and these sort of things. So there's, there's, there's some stuff that are just, that's just, it's just if you've, if you've seen stuff in the press for all these years, and all you've ever heard has been negative things, um, hopefully not everything, hopefully there's been some good things in there too. Hopefully you've watched Peaky Blinders with lots of rolling gypsies in it. Mm -hmm. And you'll, have, you'll think some really positive things about gypsies for that reason. But if, you, if you've got that, you might have some preconceptions and just addressing those and recognising them and trying to reassess um, actually whether fear is, is, is misplaced or whether actually it is well placed. Maybe actually it is a, a risky place that you're going to and things. So trying to just differentiate between these two things, which is it's just difficult to start emotions. They're not easy to separate out sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a picture of one of the sites that we work on quite a lot. So it's actually quite a lovely place, quite communal. People are in the houses, people are chatting to each other. Often if you're walking through the front gates of the site, people will say hello and um, shout out to you and things. If they don't know who you are, they might ask who you are. Um, if you come on with an, another service that they recognise, that might help people to just recognise that um, they, you don't seem like a stranger just walking um, onto the site <coughs> and things. It's usually good to go with someone that they know. Yeah. Um, so this is the transit bit. Over there is the permanent. So they've got their own uh, utility blocks and that. On this side, they haven't got the utility block. They've just got one large utility block. But this is for transit, so it's three months, and the other side is permanent. Yeah, that's what I tried to say. Is that adhered to, then, that the three months? Use your transit site is uh, about three months stay. Yeah. 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 And the rest of it's quite happy to, to move. They're ready to move on for three months. Not always. Right. It depends on. The, so um, is that policed then? Um, with <laughs> no, it's a local authority. So there's um, it's managed by the local authority. They've got a liaison team. Right. So what we try and do at the moment, we're trying to get the liaison team to take on some of the service issues and that. Mm -hmm. Whether that be helping them find the right services, benefits, whatever it is they yeah. need. If they have got a long-term illness, then we have to sort of challenge it with them to get them to stay there longer. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, they're not going to get that treatment. Yeah. There yeah. is another transit site further down the road, mm -hmm. which comes into East Sussex. So sometimes they have to come from here to there and back again. Mm -hmm. So it's not ideal, but at least they've got somewhere. that would be the better practice, if there is somebody at end of life, is to stay in that area, mm -hmm. yeah. which is a lot better mm -hmm. for that patient, really. Yeah. I think in most cases, if someone is on a pitch on a transit site and it's clear that there's a real health need there, mm. then um, 
generally the health people listen to. Sometimes people, sometimes local authorities are just so used to moving on travellers, they won't really consider it properly, won't do the full yeah. assessment. But I think if a health professional gets involved, then that should make a difference if you're able to have a conversation with them, quite a frank conversation about what this means for the family in terms of the different different for their for the person's health and not. And if that fails, then we can get you can get in touch with us and we can take it on from an advocacy point of view or even move on to a legal point of view and things. But actually, most of the time, I think if you have that conversation, it should be a it should have a good outcome. Most people are quite decent and reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you bump into someone who's not, then there's definitely ways to find that. <laughs> Do the permanent sites have hookups then? Have, do they have water and electricity? Yeah. yeah. There's hookups on this side. On the this is what side. these are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's electricity yeah. and water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously with the um, permanent, they've got the blocks. So they've yeah, actually got... They've got a kitchen. They've got the kitchen, they've got the shower, and they've got a living area right. in there as well, which is quite nice. Mm. So they're sleeping in their units, or they've brought mo- bigger mobile units, the bigger one at the back there. So as time's going on, they're now moving into these bigger units. Right. So it's more of a home. Um, so yeah, long term like meeting, wasn't it? The more like um, static or big ones, and there's something like a touring caravan, so maybe a smaller caravan that people yeah. will take when they're travelling out and things and stuff that might not take every thing. And that is something that um, social services get a bit confused about. This would be for living in yeah. and for adults to sleep in. Mm. And this can invariably be used for children to sleep in. Yeah. That's their bedroom. Mm. And we've had it with uh, children's services and social services, the fear that the children are sleeping elsewhere than the parents at the night time. Mm-hmm. But it's their lifestyle, it's their way of life, they've been born to this. And like all parents, there's a lurch, isn't there? When mm-hmm. a child wakes up in the night, even if they're in there, they know that something's going on. So we, yeah, we've had to take uh, cases on and actually prove to them that this is their bedroom. And they've, you know, they've taken it on board and they've accepted that. So yeah. Depending on the size of your house as well, it could be their parents are sleeping inside a house and the kids are that the same distance away sort of thing. Yeah. They're upstairs. There's some yeah. big houses. Yeah. 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 Apart from that, and nobody bothers when you go camping, do you? And you've got your time and your kids down. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I think it's just the risk averse nature maybe of um, house social brigades sometimes now. Um, and things, so it just takes that conversation sometimes, mm-hmm. it's good to have. Um, so we've got, we've got really high levels of curs in gypsy and traveller communities. So um, of all, all ethnic groups in, in England and Wales, then gypsies and travellers are the groups that are most likely to be curs, and they're most likely to be um, providing more than um, 50 hours of, of unpaid care um, as well. Um, and carers generally tend to have poorer health than the general population. Um, but within gypsy and traveller communities, um, it's about your health is 1.9 times likely to be as poor if you are um, a carer. Uh, compared to other gypsy and travellers and things. Um, I know you were talking about in the trade line here about um, even sometimes when people are in, um, like not in the home and being cared for now, like a clinical <coughs> setting and things, then people might continue to care for their, their loved ones and, and take on as much as they can of that process and things. So I guess it's about negotiating uh, with families and things. It's about what's reasonable for them to be doing and things. And that's seen as a real way of, um, of showing love to someone, of showing respect to them and things. And, and I'm sure it's similar with a lot of other um, cultures and families and things too. So it's just yes, about it them. Is. Because, um, if you say to a gypsy, um, you're entitled to a, a carer's allowance, you're entitled to a carer's assessment, mm-hmm. they'll look at you and say, but it's what I do. It's, it's, mm-hmm. And you get that from most carers, don't you? Mm-hmm. They'll say, but it's what I do. And they say, no, but you have got this right. If you don't use it, mm-hmm. you're going to lose yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so that's another part of our job, to make sure they're getting carer's allowance, to make sure they're getting their carer's assessments done. And if possible, we've even got direct payments involved sometimes. Um, by proof of it being the culture. But not all counties will do that. Mm-hmm. West Sussex will or East Sussex won't. So that's odd. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so if you are working with um, a lot of carers or random person and things, then you might want to check if they're actually receiving the things they need to and point them towards the local citizens advice bureau, that sort of thing, to help them with um, like form filling and understanding the rights around carers and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, as we said before, then uh, gypsy and trauma families tend to, not everyone, but tend to have a really strong preference um, for carers from within the same community. Um, we did some research in the summertime, we just, we just talked to like 20 different people about it, it was about dementia and people's perception of that, and I think some of the, the big fears they came across was that people weren't wanting to get diagnosed with dementia because they thought, if I get dementia, they're going to take um, me away, or they're going to take him or her away, and they're going to put them in a home, and basically there would just be this, like, it's a... You either have no dementia or you have uh, diagnosed dementia and then you lose all control basically over what, what you're saying and things over stuff. So be clear about that, that sort of thing as well. Um, 
it's always going to be quite good. And then uh, most people said that it was uh, for, uh, significantly over half said that they would definitely want to care for their own family members and wouldn't want anyone else from outside the family unit. Um, and some people might, some people um, might be okay with people in the wider community from the same community as them um, being cared for, but um, maybe not someone from outside of that. So gorgeous sort of thing um, might not be um, seen so favourably. And that's that's not just between like um, Roman Egyptians and Irish travellers. You, you often find that with like boaters and new travellers and things as well. So even though it might not be a protected characteristic and it might not be a, like an ethnic group by um, by law, people might still have that preference. And that's just, we just trust people who are similar to us, I think, in life. Um, often, so I guess it's just that coming through. Um, we, um, a lot of people, as they get um, older or old, then they, they might choose to move into bricks and mortar accommodation. Um, and often the carer who may, maybe will move in with the person into bricks and mortar accommodation. Um, and then that, that person could become sometimes quite isolated. So she can see like from the picture of the site before and things, it's quite open plan and everyone's out talking to and things. And actually, streets just aren't set up in the same way. They're not as communal, <laughs> just from the structure of where they are. Maybe a family is still travelling or they're in a different place. People can become, become, become quite lonely. Um, so recognising that might be like an additional um, issue experienced by um, some carers. And there's already maybe, as you become a carer and things, there's maybe different mental burdens and there's a level of stress and maybe uh, a, a harder, um, you have a harder time to find time to look after your own health and things. So just um, looking out for people and, and, and um, making sure that they're accessing these services that can support them with that or that other family members are recognising that um, and kind of nudging them towards looking after each other, which people naturally um, do within different travel families anyway. It's just a, a unique time that people might feel particularly lonely um, and might suffer um, with depression and things as well. And they may keep a, a caravan or trailer outside of their home, which they can get into trouble a bit before, um, because other neighbours don't like that. And the reason why it's there is in case they want to go travelling, because it's, it's in their blood, it's mm. who they are. Mm. And the biggest thing of all that they miss is if the, web, the if it's raining, especially towards end of life sort of situations, they miss the rain on the roof. It was comforting. Mm. It's what used to get them off to sleep, <coughs> things like that. So they will invariably still keep that trailer outside just in case they want to go off. Um, a lot of the things I hear people talking about in terms of like white so um like so like white so captures people to live like a nomadic way of life, it's like being uh, close to green and things. People might be very resistant to going to like a flat where they're nowhere near the ground and nowhere any near any greenery and things. Um and then also like I know I've heard a lot of people talking like I've just got itchy feet, like I don't want to be here anymore. I'm just used to travelling around and things without being being limited and stuff. Um so yeah, it's both a beautiful thing but also a sad whenever beautiful things get taken away of it. Um so yeah, I've also talked a little bit about so some, some carers might not consider themselves carers, so uh, aren't receiving support, so maybe you can help with signposting people towards that. Um, and some people might just not want to access support if they don't think like it's going to be culturally relevant. So hopefully after this presentation you feel really confident to communicate to people that they um, are going to receive culturally relevant support. Um, this is from a woman called Lady Jackie, um, it was something written, she's got a little piece in the British Medical Journal, they do like a What Your Patient Is Thinking series that some of you might have stumbled across before. And so it's her experience as a liveaboard voter um, going through end of life care. And I just thought what she said was really beautiful, so I just wanted to read it out. Um, so it's, I've got to the point now where I need carers, and they're all voters. I employ, them using my, uh, I employ them myself using the budget provided by my social worker. They know how things work on a boat. It's a completely different way of living to being in a house. You have to be careful not to use too much water or power and emptying the chemical toilets. I can't see any agency carer going 150 yards from the towpath of my bicycle and trailer at a plastic bucket full of poo. There are jobs where you need to know what you're doing, like cleaning out the ash at the stove and filling the coal scuttle up. Carers have to be prepared to lift a bag of coal and not mind if their hands get a bit dirty. So there's quite specific and quite practical reasons why people might also prefer carers and things, and it'll be the same um, in caravans and mobile homes and things. Um, and then just uh, to, to touch on then the role of faith, um, I find um, we have this, we have a, a, a resource book that I'll circulate around that it's around um, traditions and customs around um, bereavement and around death for gypsy and travel communities. And when I, I remember when I read it, so I'm from a, a Roman Catholic family in Ireland, I was like, well, loads of these are just the same as me, basically. I think that's because faith has a big role in these things and around and different care and the things that are important to people. Um, so there's a really, a really high proportion, so 64% in the census of gypsies and travellers um, from Christian communities. Um, and of those Irish travellers, um, not all, but often tend to be from uh, Roman Catholic communities that has a big influence and I imagine most people in this room at some point cared or supported someone from a, a Catholic or Christian background. It's uh, a lot more common in this country and things um, and obviously that can provide real, real hope for people 
um, some things that people might do. We often get we we so we take we take car we take our care address for people's letters while they're travelling, get them posted to us, and they can pick them up over the phone and we read them to them. And um, we say we only do it for like benefits or health, um, and those and those sort of things, uh, for bank accounts and stuff that people really need. So we're not taking like the Argos catalog when it gets sent out to you and things. Um, and something that people often um, get posted to your office is either the little medallions or holy water. <coughs> and I remember when I first got that, I was like, "But well, we don't take packages here. You really have your like these are our words as an organisation." And then, I, and then I, I, the person was like, "Well, can you open it up?" And I was like, "Oh, it's it's um, holy water." And they're like, "Well, that is a health letter, then, isn't it? Like, it's it really provides people with life, and then things are they're going to get better and things and stuff." So that I think that's really important if you're able to, if you're able to facilitate people to using those things, then that's that's always great. If people need to get them posted, and um, if people are, are living. Um, in a clinical setting and things, and if you're able to be a postal address for those sort of things, that can be really, uh, really powerful and really important for people. Um, I certainly know that my mum would be absolutely lost in a time um, like that without a big bottle of holy water. Um, so that's good. <laughs> um, and then I'm sure many people have come across this. So Roman Catholics, we usually call a priest um, to read the last rites and confession um, just before death. So that's quite an important part of the process for people. So I feel like we've talked a lot about all the different preferences and things. Um, does anyone have any questions about um, any other preferences around end-of-life end of care or things? Is there anything we haven't covered at all that needs to talk more about? I think sometimes people get nervous if somebody's referred for inpatient care from a, a, a gypsy or traveling community because I don't know how true it is, but people have said that if somebody died in a, in a caravan, that it would be set on fire, well, are they going to sit outside room on fire? <laughs> <laughs> and, side room and, and things like that. I mean, have that, that experience. So <laughs> just be fortunate in, in that matter. I don't know if that happens quite so much now, but it, it has. It happened at Appleby uh, recently. Um, probably the older generations may still want that. That would have been their dowry at one time in their life when they first came together with their partner. Maybe that trailer, everything in it would have been their life's worth, their life's keepings. So that is why it was burnt, because their life is now finished. But I don't think that happens quite as much as what it used to, yeah. because people can't afford to do this anymore, can they? Um, and I think also it's about evolving, isn't it? People have moved on from certain traditions. Well, I'm not saying that there still isn't some that would do that, because it happened to Appleby. Well, presumably they wouldn't want to damage the place where the person would Dad, it's not a room, it's, it's a trailer. Some of the high sentimental that. value it would be that people would wonder it wouldn't be a hospital or anything. No. <laughs> or I'd hope if that happens then, well. It's just the bedding would be stripped, it would be cleaned like anywhere else. Yeah, Yeah, I think if it had happened, his son definitely would have reported on it for now, yeah. so I'm pretty sure it's, it's not a thing. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that, that's the thing, is because you don't know where people's beliefs, where they come from or where they, where they stem from or what the belief is, so that's probably where that rumour's come from, I guess. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, we were talking about I think this is like more an Irish thing, and an Irish travellers therefore were kind of, I thought you think, and also maybe a Roman Catholic thing as well. Mm -hmm. Then I'm not sure if there's any, any English Roman Catholics through, but because you go on experiences, then it's quite quick, um, the next uh, three, four, maybe five days. Um, so it's yeah. about a week, isn't it, for England, really? Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a backlog. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they're so busy now, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, and very <coughs> close, you know, people have their own burial plots in the Yeah, often. Still, uh, Often families are buried um, in the in the same plot and things. We've had a lot of cases we actually in our in our advocacy service over the last year, um, where cemeteries um, so gypsy and gypsy um, graves people will visit them quite a lot. And um, there'll often be lots of flowers, there'll be big tributes and things. People will visit sometimes every day if it was really close to loved one, um, or or weekly and things, um, and pay their respects to the person. Sometimes they'll talk to the person when they're there and things. Um, and there's often things like um, people who have like curbing around the grave and stuff, and some uh, like local authority um, graveyards and things. People, um, the the rules will have changed in the last few years because maybe they have so many people they're trying to bury that they, they can't have space for these things. People might have, especially people have literally have signed the conditions, not know what conditions are, mm -hmm. and then really feel like they can't properly pay respects to the person in that area and things, and that um, kind of infringes upon that real <coughs> it, it makes really really difficult. So we've definitely been involved in some cases where we've been able to advocate that people should be allowed to have curbing. In some cemeteries that um, are used to have maybe large populations nearby um, might have a section that is like you're allowed to have curbing and things. It's a bit different, maybe it costs a bit more for each plot or something. Um, but that, that is something that um, people tend to do. And if people, if people can catch before they choose a, a plot that they're going to be buried in, that, 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 that they might have some restrictions, that's a good thing. So if you're part of that process, 
and they're certainly trying to recognise that people might prefer to have bigger graves, bigger headstones and things as well and really, and really make a big tribute to people so it might look quite different um, and, and um, more uh, bigger and um, yeah, more special than perhaps other people might have in their, their graves and things, so yeah, it's a good point. So any other questions there Tom? Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, because I, I work with quite a lot of different local authorities and they all provide different services, different criteria, so how do they, do they get that continuity? Um, I've, I've known people that have got leukaemia and they're coming to the area and you sort of say right we've got to get you registered then and they say well I don't really need to register because the hospital where we're based has already made contact with hospitals where we're going to so they've done that advanced sort of uh, phoning and so when they come into our area they already know to go to the Brighton hospital because the, their hospital, their main hospital has already contacted them if they're moving on, they've got the same thing going on. If they haven't, then obviously we've got to go into A and E and try and get them registered with uh, a local GP. Mm. So it's probably more proactive mm. than yeah. Because every area is different, yeah. Yeah. and that's so mad, isn't it? That's where central government's yeah, got to come back in. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. I think um, what we find is like some like health services that have high volumes of people coming through, then maybe they don't, they, they just like, you just have to start from scratch in the area, that, that's just it sort of thing. But I think we're in Nineveh, where there's quite unique circumstances where someone has um, quite maybe complex needs and things as well, then often you, you hope that a health professional will take, will, will then contact the next place and, and, and let them know. Most times people know where they're going to as well, um, the in the majority of cases. So that is definitely possible and things. Um, that, that's the idea that people don't have to tell their story and start from scratch. Um, especially with mental health service and things, we often have people, and not in terms of mental health care, but as in um, mental health service people, that they just end up in the same, back to the same square one constantly, and it just makes things so much worse. Um, so certainly we're trying to, um, on a national scale, try to advocate for some digital services that would help and support health professionals with making that process really easy, mm -hmm. but the system's just not there yet um, in, in most places, so anything you can do as an individual would be really, really, I'm sure people would really appreciate it. Not the population isn't. So are they the same as the rest of the population? They are. Or are they quite <coughs> to talk about? I would think cancer is a big no no still. Um, as much as I've known the families on that site since they were little children, some of them. Um, when I was at a, an event at Preston Park recently, it was a football event, and some of the families came down to support their young ones, the, cancer, the skin cancer people were there. Mm. So I went over and got different bands and different uh, protection and what have you for them. They were fine about wearing the bands to find out if their um, spray protection was enough or not. Uh, and they said they use um, sun creams and what have you and that. When I went back over and spoke to them again, they were doing inspections on moles and things and that. And they said they'd always go down on site to talk to them about it. So I went back to the women and I said what they're doing. I said, would you like them to come down and speak to you? They went, no, 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 no. You know, you know we don't talk about things like that. And if we wanted to, we'd go to the doctor. So I thought, oh, that's fair enough. They, they're prepared to go to the doctor as a collective group. They didn't want to talk about it still. So, so can I discuss my advanced care planning? That wouldn't... Would they be open, do you think? Or? The older members, yes, because there is a, a, an older family member and her husband's been going through different treatments recently. She's open, but it's the younger ones that wasn't. It's the younger mm -hmm. women that wasn't, which mm -hmm. was interesting. So, so yes, so the, the mother was very open um, and she's worked alongside and fortunately he seems to be okay at the moment which is good mm. um, so yeah she was more open she's open to lots of talking mm. about lots of things isn't mm. she yeah um, but yeah it's just coming down there the generations mm. to hopefully reassure them thank you I think what it comes I think um, there's sometimes it can be more of a fear on prevention and stuff and things because it's not necessary to talk about it and is that feeling like if I say it well that happens sort of thing yeah. Yeah. Um, which a lot of us just, I mean, I'm superstitious sometimes, <laughs> sort of thing, so you get, you get scared about things, but when it comes down to, um, like, a, a conversation about knowing things, that's not, I mean, people want to know what's happening with them and things, I guess. Yeah. Then advanced care plan is just, just a terrifying conversation generally, isn't it, yeah. for most people, um, to come into terms with a lot of things. Is there any questions there at all? Oh, can we just ask about um, medication? Medication. 
again, they bring a prescription with them. Um, if there hasn't been any contact made with anyone local, then we've got then got to get them into a GP. That's got to be recognised. They've got to make contact with the other GP, or we go into A and E. Um, and we've done research, haven't we, with A and E? And because a lot of people felt that gypsies and travellers were using A and E in the wrong way, but they actually don't. They're using it in the correct manner, um, and that is the best place to go if you're in doubt. Anybody. Um, but if, as long as they've got that prescription with them and we can make the contact with the GP before and get the information we need, then they can gain their medication. Um, the next section then um, is about um, death and bereavement and it kind of touches on what the point that you raised about talking about um, death. This is an interview with one of our co-workers. Um, I think it was like there's it's a death death marriage week. We did like a blog about it. So she talks about how her family, um, mark um, death and dying and things. Um, and so the question we asked her is, is death and dying something that gypsies and travellers talk about in your experience? She said not really, not until after it's happened. Um, and you all kind of think it's not going to happen. When my granddad was ill, we all thought it's got he's going to get better. He's going to get better. It's not going to happen. So when it finally did happen, it was it was quite a shock. It was difficult. Um, with what she said about it. And then some of the traditions around death and bereavement. So um, when, when a member of the gypsy community is dying um, or has died, um, then the, the family will often want to take the person um, home, uh, take the body home. Um, and then a, a vigil is usually kept over the body by, by family members. It's quite similar in, in my family. I think this is quite um, common in a lot of um, communities and things. And then um, in some situations, then it's, it's, about, it's about creating like this private space and things in this space where you can really focus on on this person who's, who's passed away. And so sometimes people maybe well, maybe inside a caravan or maybe inside a home they might um, bring a curtain across or, or drape sheets and things to create the kind of space where people can really have that, that last time with um, with their loved one. Um, and usually the person w won't be left alone at all. Um, in Catholic families it's quite common, um, especially in the last night, that people will stay awake the whole night um, with the person. Um, and sometimes depending on if it's a young person, you might have a, lots of people around. If it's an older person, it might be smaller. Uh, numbers of people and things, but normally someone will, will stay awake with them or at least uh, sleep next to the body and things. Um, it's usually in an open casket, um, unless people specifically ask for it not to be an open casket, and it's quite rare that people want to be cremated. Um, this is for uh, Romani Gypsy and Irish traveller, kind of Scottish Gypsy and traveller, Welsh Gypsy and traveller families. It might be quite different with um, with new traveller and, and border families that's in terms of um, traditions around death and dying. I wouldn't say that there's an overall tradition for um, voters or, or new travellers and things. It's maybe more different and uh, more creative. It might depend on the, the family that person's come from to begin with, or maybe a, a big send off in, in their own way. Um, it's quite common then for a, a fire to be lit outside the home um, of the deceased person, and men will often gather around the fire, um, and women often will be inside with a, um, a kettle on the boil and lots of tea and coffee. Um, which always helps everything. <laughs> um, and then uh, Irish travellers, I think again linked to kind of uh, Catholicism, then there'll be lots of like candles lit and things, um, and those candles stay lit till after the funeral. Um, and after uh, what during that time then there'll just be a constant flow of people who will be coming in and out um, and paying their respects uh, to the deceased. Um, and a lot of the times then it's quite important that, that that coffin is kept open and things, people want to see their loved one for the last time. Um, and it's it's um, from a quite young age then mm -hmm. that people will be so it wouldn't be that oh you wait till you're 18 years old before you, it's felt that you should deal with that but from a young age people are, are dealing with that um, and processing that um, yeah and we, we keep our children off school they'll be off school and they'll be with us they're with the family so that they're learning what death is about <coughs> and what it's about to stay together and organize a funeral mm -hmm. so that one day they're not like some people, because I've known lots of people who are looking to say, what do I do now? They've died, what do I do? They, mm -hmm. they don't know where to start. We're, we're liking to think that maybe one day our children will know what they have to do mm -hmm. and where that person will be, <coughs> their remains will be. And as you say, buying the plots, having yeah. them ready. Mm -hmm. Then there's, um, like with funeral directories, people might have a certain funeral director that they know organise good um, traveller funerals as well. Um, and they understand all the needs, they won't have to explain it from scratch and things. So I imagine most families will have a link or, or know where they would go to for that and um, things. Um, and that can be really helpful in that time. Yeah, so with the open casket. Um, and as you asked before, then so Irish travel families tend to have you quite quickly. Um, and then it, it 
depending on, on the person and, and the family and things, and um, a lot of people maybe were, if somebody who's close to them died, they might wear black for a year. Some people, if it's somebody who's really close to them, they might wear black for the rest of their lives. Um, it's, it's different for different people. It could be seen as quite disrespectful not to wear um, black and things. And some people are more traditional than others, so there's just going to be that <coughs> natural difference. You may, may see some of the older generations wearing what they call a mourning apron, which is a very lovely white pressed up apron. And they wear that during their mourning time with their black, so that people are aware that they're in mourning, that someone's passed. Not too many today, but you, the older generations just do tend to do that. So this is again from the interview with Ivy. So do you think rituals help with the bereavement process? Yes, I think it does. It's a respect thing. We have a fire and we'd like as many people to come to show respect. There will always be food, tea and coffee available. There will always be a team of women or girls mucking in. I don't think it gives much time to grieve, but that's what you initially do. And then once they're buried, that's when you can go away and pull yourself back in to kind of look at um, process things. Maybe after that, so people might just be quite busy actually in the days after a death. This is another quote from, so just kind of to give you a perspective from like a border community, so not the traditional Egyptian traveller community, I think this is really beautiful, and from Lady Jackie. So I've asked for regular scans so I can be prepared, and at some point I'm going to look at a scan and know that I've not got long. I've got it all sorted, and I've had some last plan on my funeral with family and friends. I'll be supported to die at home, and then I want to do things the old-fashioned way. I want my body to be kept on the boat for a few days. I'll go down the canal on my friend's beautiful wooden launch to trumpets played by musicians from the community and a procession down the towpath. I have friends who are performance artists and who have, her, who have a hearse covered with skeletons and green lights and that will take me from the canal to the burial ground. I can have it exactly how I want it. It's quite a beautiful vision for a funeral, I think. <laughs> um, this is some of the more traditional like gypsy traveller funerals. Um, so as you know, you probably you might have seen um, articles, something that actually some of the big tabloids cover really beautifully is gypsy traveller funerals because they're just so visually um, beautiful and gorgeous to see and things never will be different from this. But um, so this is like a Vardo, a traditional like uh, old gypsy wagon with the word mum on it. People will often, um, I mean, florists must make an absolute fortune from gypsy and traveling funerals. People have things like, see like a lipstick, the like Chanel nail varnish and like um, Guinness things that people might have like floral, floral tributes that represent their interests and things that they like in life. Um, I've seen ones with like iron brew and things on them and lots of different things. So um, it's a really beautiful and really um, way to, to show respect to people. Um, I've noticed a lot of um, a lot of like chat, like if someone uh, passes away, then often the family might do like a big fundraiser or an event um, for the like the hospice they've been in, or maybe for like Millen or for like um, whoever's been involved in the care of that family and things. Or in some cases where um, families, uh, some of dementias went into a home then the, the family really do make a big effort to say a huge thank you and things. Mm -hmm. and really, when, when our people receive good care, they're hugely appreciative, which I think is, reflects society at large. Um, but there's some really beautiful things that have happened. Um, and this is just some pictures of burials and things from the past. From the past. Um, so horses are just a huge part of gypsy and traveller culture generally, um, from when they uh, used to pull wagons to horse burrows and things now. Um, so you can see that that's quite a big, uh, got a cultural kind of prominence for gypsies and travellers. You can see here on that bottom one, that's see that blue and um, blue and green flag with the red wheel in it. So that's a, like the Roma flag. So the blue represents the sky and the green the earth, and that's like a a, a Varda wheel of the traditional old wagons and things. So you might see some imagery like this, particularly amongst more of the Roman gypsy or Roma communities than with Irish traveller communities, and that's got real cultural significance. Um, and uh, of just just huge um, um, funerals often. Um, and, and then of course that's where you might have to contact local police and things so they know that certain roads might be blocked off and work out how to manage that on a kind of people management sort of level um, more than anything. Yeah, so then it's quite, it's quite normal for people to look after the grave really well, to go and visit that grave regularly. Um, perhaps on a daily basis, especially if it's a young person who's passed away. And here's some pictures of um, some of the old wagons um, being burnt. So this is quite a rare thing to happen nowadays, but it is um, a historical thing that was, that was quite significant. Um, and I guess uh, maybe it would be often older people and maybe some significant um, community members and things who, who might ch uh, choose uh, to have their, their, their varda or their wagon or their caravan um, burnt. I think um, there's often, and I know from speaking to Ivy for a good, like, uh, often people want to live in a caravan if someone's passed away in it. And that's something that from living in Romania and working with women communities, I think maybe has come from some uh, historical things because uh, if someone had died in the house, people often wouldn't want to live in that house and things as well. 
Um, so this, that's something that's quite um, maybe a, a commonality between Roma and Roman Gypsy communities. That's kind of the end of our third section then. Does anyone have any questions at all on that? Or any questions actually, it's probably your last big chance to ask questions mm -hmm. about the session, so just anything at all. <laughs> So that just brings us back, I think, just the few key, key principles. Um, so just really good communication um, in, in all the ways that we've kind of described and um, treating people with dignity and respect, um, trying to develop your cultural understanding um, and then just recognising that everyone's different. So uh, giving people equitable care doesn't mean giving everyone the same care. Um, so I think those are the four maybe key principles to sum it up. Is that sound okay? Thank you very much. It's been lovely. <laughs> It's really insightful that everybody has said throughout the lecture series, we just want to be us, we just want, just think of us as individuals, and that's exactly what you, you've said as well. Yeah, yeah really insightful into, into the community that is quite important to us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, so, attendance sheets, no, evaluation sheets, we all evaluation sheets that you're open. Okay. Um, if you could leave them on your chairs or the table at the back. If you've got any